What's up everybody, my name is Grady Ali. I'm an embedded software engineer and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be sharing about top 10 embedded software engineering interview questions with answers. Yes, you heard me correctly, there are going to be some answers to the to interview questions. Anyways, before we get started, let me just give you a few disclaimers. None of these questions will have any programming problems because I'm planning to do a separate video for it. So they're purely just technical, kind of conceptual embedded software engineering interview questions. Also, these questions are based on my own experience that I've had during my embedded software engineering interviews, whether I've been in the interviewer position or the interviewee position. Now, the next point is that I cannot guarantee that your interview is going to have these questions in it. But I really hope that these questions will help you build some confidence so that when you are at your interview, you will kind of know how to answer the questions and, and you will be prepared for that. <sighs> now that we're done with this boring intro, let's get into the juicy content. Explain how the SBI interface works. Well, the SBI interface typically has four data lines, MISO, MOSI, CLOCK, and chip select. When the chip select is pulled low, the device usually becomes active. That's usually the activation condition. It is a fully synchronous interface, meaning that everything between the clock, the MISO, MOSI, everything is fully in sync. If one bit is shifted into the system, into the device, then one bit is shifted out of the system at the same time. One goes in, one goes out at the same time. They're parallel, fully in sync. SBI interface can run at significantly higher speeds compared to I2C, for example. It is also possible to connect almost as many SBI devices to a MCU as, as you want, but it depends on the available GPIO pins you have for the chip select line. You can only have one active device. How does a DMA work? Well, DMA is a dynamic memory access that typically just frees up the CPU of any load. Essentially, the CPU can configure the DMA to transfer data from a peripheral to a memory or a memory to memory or memory to peripheral, any one of these combinations, essentially. Once it's configured, essentially all the stuff goes on in the background and CPU can do whatever it wants. So it, it just tells the DMA like, hey, you, you take care of all this data transfer and I will go do like the important stuff. But I mean, your job is important too, but let me, let me do some other stuff. I gotta, I gotta take care of some interrupts and stuff like that. So see you later, man. So what is a semaphore and how is it different from a mutex? Semaphore is a, an integer variable that is shared between multiple processes or threads to really synchronize the system. But really the main difference is that Semaphore doesn't have ownership associated with it. So the mutex has a ownership associated with it, meaning that if one thread locks the mutex, then other threads can't unlock it. Whereas that's not true for Semaphore. Also, Semaphore can be accessed infinite amount of times by other threads and so on. That's not the case again for, for mutex, it's only one one and one only per mutex, so only one process can access it at a time. How to collect data in parallel and in sync from two different sensors. If you have two different sensors and you have like an SBI and I2C interface, for example, how can you collect data from that setting in parallel and in sync? Essentially, you need to use timers and DMAs. The DMAs will create the parallelism, right? So you can, Actually, on a single core system, you can actually collect data in parallel with the DMAs. So you, you configure the DMAs, you set them up. Now, then use the timers to create the synchronization to make sure that those data transfers are triggered at correct times by the timers so that they are in sync. When and why would you use the keyword volatile? Well, that is question of the century. It is used to optimize code for variables that are used in critical sections, such as interrupts, memory map registers, or variables that are used between threads. Well, really, it's not optimization. It's more like a de-optimization process because you're telling the compiler to not optimize those variables or whatever the optimization is uh, set up for that specific compiler. Well, next question is very important. Are you subscribed to my YouTube channel? Be honest, okay? If you are not, 
consider subscribing to my YouTube channel right now and hit that like button as well. What are some ways to minimize MCU power consumption? Now I am talking about embedded software specifically. So typically some MCUs have some power modes and most of them do. It's highly important to utilize those power modes, whether it's sleep or stop or standby or just the system off or anything like that. So utilizing those low power modes will help to save a lot of power for the MCU itself. Another one is lowering the CPU clock speed. If you don't need to run a 64 megahertz clock speed, you should not be running 64 megahertz clock speed. You could clock it down to eight megahertz. Maybe that's all you need for your system. Another one is a very optimization specific. So really optimizing your code, minimizing the clock cycles that it takes to execute a uh, command or process or anything like that to really lower that power consumption. Another one is turning off peripherals when they're not used. Let's say you are communicating via SPI, but you only do it once every minute. So you don't need to have that SPI interface running the whole minute. You can only have it run for that 10 microseconds that you need to use it. And the rest of the time, the peripheral is turned off. Another one is Ticlocidal for real-time operating system. Some of them do have a Ticlocidal, some of them don't. But essentially the idea is that if there's nothing else to do within your operating system, then you're gonna go and sleep. And that's, that's all it does so you are not wasting clock cycles. What are the benefits of real-time operating system? I think the most important one is the scheduler. We're able to schedule the tasks and so on, what comes next and so on, and, and kind of plan the whole thing out on how our system should work. Another one is the idea of multitasking. Obviously, if you have a single core system, you can multitask because you have a single core. So you can create an illusion of multitasking. With the scheduler, you, you kind of have that determined behavior. So you know what's gonna happen, you know what's gonna be the next task, you know what is gonna have, be happening next. So you kind of can predict it. Should we always use a real-time operating system? Why or why not? Well, the uh, simple answer is no we should not always use one. And the reason is that there are plenty of solutions out there that can be done with a simple bare metal code, just written out, no need for an operating system, especially if you're limited on that code space in your MCU. It takes a lot more code space than a simple code would take. Keeping that in mind is highly important. Again, there's no need to overcomplicate a system that can be done in a very simple manner in maybe even a few lines of code, right? And maybe it's just a button press and turning on an LED. There's no need for a real-time operating system for that. What are the main points to remember when writing an interrupt service routine? First of all, keep it short. Don't perform any logging or prints in it. Don't do delays in it. Don't use semaphores or mutexes in it. Don't try to re-enable interrupts inside one. Don't use any long, crazy loops inside of it. That really goes with the first point I said, but just don't, no, no crazy loops, no loops. Just keep it short, that's it. You go in, you go out, you're done, bam. What are little and big Indian? Honestly, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but essentially the idea is that big Indian means that the big end of the word or whatever you're trying to store is stored first in the memory address. So essentially the, the highest byte, for example, is stored first. And little endian essentially means that the little end is stored first. So the, the lowest byte, for example, is, is stored first in that memory address. Last bonus question is, what is a pull-up and a pull-down resistor? So a pull-up resistor is used to keep an unused input pin at a high value, essentially. So it pulls the, the signal high when there's there's nothing else going on. Now the pull down resistor will keep that unused input signal at a low level when, again, when it's not used. So if there's nothing going on, there's no external device trying to pull this line up or down or do anything like that, then those are kind of the default values it defaults to thanks to those pull up resistors. Feel free to leave other embedded software engineering technical interview questions in the comment section below so that it could benefit anyone else who might be coming to watch this video so they can learn from you 
And I honestly, guys, I can't do this alone. I need your guys' help. I need this to be a community for, for, where people can find these questions and find these answers. Thank you so much, guys, for checking out this video. I truly, truly appreciate it. Make sure you hit that like button. Consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Other than that, I'm out of here. Bye.